freedom. Now, these interventions have certainly brought discussion on the problem of autonomy much farther than where modern liberal thinking had left it. Yet, I would like to argue that focusing on autonomy is misleading. Autonomy may even be an important condition for freedom, but it's only one part of it. You cannot be free without being autonomous, but being autonomous does not automatically mean being free. This particularly emerges if we consider that the contrary of autonomy is heteronomy, a condition where one is given the law by something else. Whereas the opposite of freedom is domination, something that can occur in ways other than simply by giving the law to somebody, from somebody else. The tyranny of society can take place in different many ways which go well beyond the law and include, as I've already mentioned, even self-oppression and voluntary servitude. In some, freedom and autonomy are, conceptually speaking, only partially overlapping. Uh, for those who are skeptical about uh, philosophical and analytical distinction, just think about common language. If I say that my children are autonomous because they can eat on their own and dress up on their own, this doesn't mean that they are free. To sum up on this issue, to be autonomous is not yet enough to, uh, to be free. But it's not just a question of terminological, uh, a terminological issue. It's a question of conceptual clarity that has crucial consequences on the practice of freedom. For instance, many autonomous movements giving rise to communities based on the principle of autonomy uh, understood as uh, the main road for the realization of freedom are facing, in my view, a great challenge. Let us admit for the moment that one can realize something like a completely autonomous community. Eh? The question is, are the people living in such community really free? I think that they are possibly autonomous in the sense of being in de materially independent, if they manage to do so, from the outside, but by no means free and perhaps not even self-determined. If you live in a self-imposed ghetto, separated from the rest of the world, you are not free because you cannot live where you want, but you're not even self-determined because your choice to live in that particular community is imposed on you by some external factors. So to conclude on this point, freedom, maybe freedom is a more cumbersome concept than autonomy. Uh, autonomy is a much thinner uh, concept, therefore it may appear more easy to, be, to realize. But at the same time, I believe freedom is a burden that we have to take on us if we want to avoid the self-imposed ghetto of autonomy. Third step, black and red, reciprocal antidotes. Now, I have until now tried to illustrate why Marxism and anarchism converge in the idea that freedom can only be freedom of equals. What I want to do now is to argue that a connubial with, between Marxism and anarchism is particularly beneficial in that they can find in each, that they can find in each other a reciprocal antidote to their possible degeneration. First, Anarchism finds in Marxism a good antidote to prevent a possible individualist twist in its absolutization of freedom. It's a fact that the radical praise of freedom that characterizes anarchism in its historical manifestation has been declining in both directions, the individualist and the collectivist. According to the former, freedom is mainly the freedom of the individual, whereas according to the latter, which we have analyzed here under the name of Bakunin, Freedom can only be obtained collectively. The point is not only that, historically speaking, an individualist interpretation of anarchism has been possible. Much more radical, individualism is a temptation that is always present within anarchism. Think of Stirner that I've mentioned. Think of anarcho-capitalism, for instance. One may simply dismiss this position as fallacious Robinson aids. Uh, as we have said, but the point remains that they are still very influential because they align with the prevailing individualist assumption of the Western society we live in. So the danger is there. In light of the difficulties encountered in promoting 
uh, the, the realization of the freedom of equals on a larger scale, anarchists may easily fall into the individualist temptation and limit their fight to the realization of spaces of autonomy in small self-enclosed communities. This, I believe, is the risk that many autonomous movements are facing at the moment in Italy, where I come from, as well as elsewhere. The creation of autonomous community <coughs> may well turn into a form of individualism on a larger scale. The creation of such spaces is usually justified on the basis that they would prefigure what a free society might look like. But I'm afraid they risk prefiguring nothing but what the society actually already is, that is, individual, smaller, singular, or bigger communities pursuing their own interests in isolation. For this possible degeneration, Marxists maintain a powerful antidote. Marx's critique of the Robinson Aids can be extended to all levels to concretely support the idea that we are either or free or all equally slaves. The reason why Marxism <clears throat> is better equipped than traditional anarchism to make this point is that it more systematically focuses on the economic conditions for the realization of such freedom. Few intellectuals, I believe, have embarked on such an extensive analysis of the concrete economic condition for the realization of freedom as Marx did. As such, his critique of the idea that to describe an ideal state of thing will automatically engender changes in society simply because of its intrinsic intellectual value is a powerful reminder of the dangers of any abstract metaphysic of freedom. By envisaging utopian communities on the sole basis of the fanatical belief in the miraculous effect of one's own theory, one risks ending up in a reactionary position, unable to keep the pace with the current state of the world. Now, I cannot enter here a detailed discussion of Marx's contribution uh, to the analysis of capitalism and modernity, but sure, there are parts of it that uh, are outdated, in particular, I would argue for the novelties brought about by post-Fordism and flexible capitalism, but I still believe that there are uh, the basic uh, of uh, Marx's analysis of capitalism still hold today. Uh, there are two points that I would like to mention here. First of all, there is the analysis of capitalism capacity to overcome all sorts of political and cultural barriers. We live in a epoch where there is so much talk about globalization and the crisis of nation state that it engenders that it, is, that it became something like a commonplace to talk about globalization. But it's so striking that nobody, usually all this talk about globalization, they don't mention Marx. <coughs> Consider, for instance, this passage from the manifesto that Marx wrote with Ingalls. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. In the place of old ones, satisfied by the production of the country, we find new ones, requiring for their satisfaction the products of decent lands and climes. In place of the, all the local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations. And as in the material, so also in the intellectual production. The, the intellectual creation of individual nations become common property. National one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures, there arises something like a world literature." End quote. In a time where there is so much about the novelties brought about by globalization, uh, which so, so many argue call for a new form of cosmopolitanism, it's really worth to go back to this passage. Uh, uh, here Marx and Engels clearly point to the cosmopolitan character of capitalism itself, to the fact that with, with its heavy artillery of cheap prices uh, and commodities, capitalism will batter down all and every Chinese walls. 
One cannot but be struck by the timeliness of this remark. I think it's only the historical amnesia of a generation of scholars that after 89 became too quickly ex-Marxist can explain how is it possible to talk so much about globalization as a novelty of the last 30 years without even mentioning uh, an author who had predicted it so clearly uh, more than a century ago. So Marx economic analysis, I would like to add, gave further an opinion to the notion of freedom as freedom of equals with its path-breaking analysis of commodity fetishism. If Bakunin is right in saying that freedom has to be freedom of equals because from the beginning we are subjected to the tyranny of society which exposes its material and their representational significations on our mind and bodies, then it is precisely from the possible commodification of such significations that we have to begin. Perhaps only the visionary and situationist Guy Debord has sufficiently underlined this, this point with his idea of a global society of spectacle. The boards recovered Marx's fundamental insight about commodity fetishism and brought it to a further level. Whereas Marx began capital by arguing that the world has become an immense collection of commodities, the board rephrases this claim by saying that, quote, in society dominated by modern condition of production, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles spectacles understood as a relation between human beings. However, it's not only anarchism that needs Marxism if a freedom of equals is to be realized. Anarchism plays an equally crucial role because it contains the antidote for possible statist and authoritarian degeneration of Marxism. It is a fact that Marx remained vague as to the path to realize freedom. If it is clear that according to him, the freedom of equals can only be obtained through a radical revolution that subverts the capitalist system of productions, the way to bring about such a revolution changed considerably in his various writings. Whereas Marx is ambiguous on this point, and in some places does not hesitate to speak about a dictatorship of the proletariat, Bakunin is clear. clear. If freedom is the end, Freedom must also be the means to realize the end. As Malatessa, after William Bull put it, to endanger freedom with the pretext to protect it, be it through the dictatorship of the proletariat or any other avant-garde party that should authoritatively lead the masses to the revolution, is a dangerous nonsense which cannot but ultimately destroy freedom. I think the experience of the Soviet Union showed that Bakunin was right when he criticized the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, along with any other authoritarian attempt to realize freedom of equals. There is not just one absolute truth about the road to revolution, and therefore no avant-garde party, however well-versed in theory it might be, can ever explain to the masses from above how they should liberate themselves, even less so tell them to do it through a dictatorship of the proletariat. If you restrict freedom, albeit temporarily, with the, the, with the pretext of preparing its realization, you cannot end up but with destroying freedom. As a consequence, any worker state be it a dictatorship of the proletariat or not, cannot but reproduce the same logic of every state, that is, a minority of bureaucrats ruling over a majority of the people. To conclude on this point, anarchism is an antidote that communists of all sorts, in my view, need. As Proudhon pointed out very clearly, communism can well be realized even through authority itself. Anarchism, on the contrary, cannot. To put it bluntly, Marxists have proof 